So thank you very much. And uh, let me bring you greetings from the uh, small but beautiful West African country called Sierra Leone. Uh, let me also apologize that, uh, but first let me thank the Uniwai Daya for inviting me to this session to serve as a discussant for this very important topic and uh, revenue mobilization. Um, I couldn't make it in person, and for that I apologize for several reasons. First, relating to the fact that uh, for me to get a visa to Norway will require me to travel to another country. But secondly, we just had some changes at the National Revenue Authority, uh, for which uh, there's a new Commissioner General that needed to support that transition. So it is on that grounds that uh, I couldn't make the, the trip to Norway. However, I'm happy to actually serve as a discussant in this case. So research around fiscal state and, and the tax capacity remains important for Africa, of course, and many uh, uh, low-income countries, as revenue mobilization remains low and far from adequate to support national development programs and meeting the SDGs by 2030. A fiscally capable government can deliver development outcomes for a citizen on several fronts, whether from social development, financing social development, investing it, uh, accountability improvements. Therefore, improving our fiscal capacity will help not only to finance uh, the SDGs, but also to improve governance and reduce dependence on foreign aid. Uh, in this uh, research on fiscal state, I know there are up to eight papers that have been uh, published in the special issue. But of course, I'll focus my comments on the three papers that have been presented by uh, Antonio, Marina, as well as all that. And then my presentation, of course, my comment, my discussion will actually be based on the policy implications of these findings and not on methodology, rather, both for South Saharan Africa, but also my country, Sierra Leone, where I stay. So first, let me start with the comments. I actually made something like three pages as a, a discussion note. For these are presentations. So let me start first with the first presentation by Antonio on fiscal states in developing countries, which kind of introduces the various papers under this special issue. So most of the eight papers under the special issues are already covered and summarized by Antonio in his uh, presentation. So the insights from the program, this research project are relevant, and of course they have policy implications, important policy implications for sub-Saharan Africa. First, the first one, that uh, LICs require time to build fiscal, states, fiscal capacity and to be sustained uh, primarily on tax revenues instead of foreign aid, resource revenues, and non tax revenues. But of course, the question will come up how long would it take Sub Saharan Africa to be dependent on donors? Strong conditionalities are associated with uh, bilateral aid and its high debt service requirements limit the flexibility afforded to LIC governments and lead the African continent to a cycle of a perpetual indebtedness. But then the question for Antonio again, can we have estimates of how long it will take some of our countries in Africa to actually reach the fiscal state level as defined by uh, Carolina, Car Caroline and the Gija in their conceptualization paper? Probably we need to get some estimates on that. The second policy implication from Antonio's paper is that politics matters. The argument is that any constraint on executive powers arising from tax revenues and political institutions is likely to coexist and even be reversed in the long run. This finding presents evidence on the need to provide some level of executive constraints to ensure accountability as well as tax revenue mobilization. But some questions here again. But should African government have to wait to face constraints before they learn how to tax? We have seen our development partners, particularly the IFIs, where they have been employing constraints similar to, 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 to such to these ones I have explained to ensure fiscal prudence, fiscal prudence. We also know the important role of a parliamentary oversight as a constraint to ensure the executive delivers and implement tax policies that are revenue enhancing. But then we have controlled parliaments. They exist in Africa. And they play a role in, in, uh, in kind of uh, enacting tax exemptions, partly because they are well, they are not well remunerated, and therefore they pursue rent seeking the process of uh, uh, enacting most of the requests for tax exemptions by uh, the international companies, but also because they are affiliated with the ruling executive. While strong executive powers can help implement difficult tax policies, 
they can also lead limited oversight and formulation of policies that are not fiscal capacity enhancing and for unproductive expenditures to go unmonitored. The third thing brought out by uh, Antonio in terms of policy implication is that we have to look beyond fiscal capacity and think about other things such as uh, information capacity, which of course are very important. In terms of information capacity, the study is on point when they argue that when states have accurate information about their subject populations, territories, and economies, they are more effective at mobilizing revenues. But again, here I have so many important questions. What kind of information are states gathering about uh, taxpayers and the population? What are the tools being used to capture taxpayer information? What is being done with this information to inform risk management and compliance uh, improvements in Sub-Saharan Africa? In fact, are the politicians provided with the, with the relevant information? Take, for instance, when it comes to exemptions. The same parliament actually granted exemptions. Are they provided information in terms of revenue loss leads to these exemptions? So probably they might reconsider their decisions going forward in terms of the level of the exemption they are granting and that's actually affecting revenue mobilization. The final factor that's actually brought up by Antonio is that history matters as well. Of course, I'll focus here on the Rwanda case. That in as much as history and political elites play the role in generating tax revenues during and during and following the 1994 genocide, the events of past three decades have had an outsized effect on the country's trajectory. Are these social networks still operational in contemporary Rwanda? That's another question. If they exist, what level of influence do they have on central government state capacity? Because we know in Rwanda at the moment, how much these social uh, 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 groups are actually influencing revenue collection in Rwanda? Rwanda may be influenced by several other factors beyond those things when it comes to the performance of Rwanda Revenue Authority in terms of their fiscal capacity. The argument of Rwanda uh, case studies that modern Rwanda state is a continuation of a particular type of traditional state in Africa. Social contracts indeed are still very much important in Africa, particularly in the rural settings. The extent to which they, they, they exact their influence is not very clear. What is clear, however, is that ethnic and regional cohesions still exist in most African countries and still hold a role in elections. And to the extent that the influence state capacity, I would rather say that is unethical state capacity, since others are left out. So in essence, it is obvious that uh, the, the, at understanding that the, the, the responsibility of revenue mobilization is not only a, a tax administration matter, it's quite important for overall revenue mobilization and state capacity in Africa. It is not uncommon in the, in the African context for low revenue GDP ratios to be associated with poor performance from revenue administrations. So the blame is actually usually on revenue administrations whenever revenue GDP is quite low, on the grounds that there's inability to improve compliance or expand the tax base, and then of course implement technocratic reforms that should raise revenue collection. But then the role of tax policy, weak economic growth, especially in taxable sectors, the prevalence of exemptions granted by politicians, that's the parliament and the executive, are mostly ignored. Now, my comment on the second presentation by uh, Marina, which is, of course, important on the importance of state assigned property rights to state compliance, in sub, I mean, to tax compliance in sub Saharan Africa. This has important handings with relevant policy implications. The paper makes it clear that strong property rights can play a dual function. As the authors note, state upheld property rights may increase tax consents. Property rights also enable uh, additional mechanisms through which to raise revenue. Cadastras are an important component of the state's ability to identify taxpayers and, of course, raise revenue. Freetown, which is the capital city of Sierra Leone, is investing in its cadastra, having already identified most property within the city, and is combining this with a simplified points-based method for assessing property values. This has already helped to increase municipal revenue and ensuring that the tax burden on low tax low income residents is lowered since they are using actually a points based system which is transparent and of course can enhance trust in the process however achieving the requirement for revenue adequacy of 14 percent of gdp to finance sustainable development goals by 2030 cannot be accomplished through property taxes alone as also highlighted by the author the importance of property rights mechanism therefore hinges on its ability to influence willingness to pay other forms of taxes 
particularly those collected by central government. While the applicability of the findings of this study for urban areas where the land tenure system provides for state backed ownership of land is relevant, what should we make of the findings for rural areas, given the fact that most of the land is traditionally owned? Relatedly, how should we expect the value of land to affect the degree to which strong property rights influence tax consent? A significant motivating factor behind the payment of property taxes in urban areas is the risk that non-payment prevents the transfer of ownership. In Sierra Leone, land is considerably cheaper in rural areas, and competition for ownership of land for developmental purposes is not as high as you can find in urban areas. Correspondingly, people in rural settings are not as insistent on getting land ownership legislated, so long as the landowning families have demarcated a piece of land. They may both be interesting. They, this may both be interesting area of evidence actually for future research, uh, if uh, uh, the researchers may be interested in that. And now on the final presentation by uh, Oded on pre-colonial centralization and tax compliance norms in contemporary Uganda. This, this uh, research has very important findings and very interesting ones as well that explain the role of historical institutions on contemporary fiscal states and to provide explanations on the root causes of variation in the quality of institutions and norms that lead to differences in tax compliance. The extent to which these historical legacies continue to influence tax attitude and tax authorities today, however, is not fully clear. Now, some questions. Does this digital era generation, where we have younger people now in Africa, do they really care about the historical impacts of today's uh, compliance needs? Is foreign influence or the need for regional comparison not rather play an important role in explaining current tax compliance? Is the tax system structure not rather influenced by tax administration assessment tools such as others? If you go to most African countries in terms of the structure of their tax system, they look at other comparator countries and they look at all these standard instruments, tax diagnostic assessment tools that assess tax administrations, and then they will design their tax system consistent with that. Tools like TADAT, ISURA, ATAFS, uh, uh, annual tax uh, outlook, things like the MTRS, the IMS medium term revenue strategy. They have some consistent things, some standards that they expect countries to actually implement. If you look at the DTMM by the OECD, the, the digital transformation maturity models, they also have standards that they expect our countries to actually uh, implement if they want to reach some digital maturity. So I think some of these things actually kind of uh, influence most of the design of structures structures in Africa rather than even historical uh, structures. Probably for informal taxes that are largely, that are largely collected by village chiefs, the importance of this pre-colonial institutional background matters, as their rural ancestors still instill in them the relevance of honoring these taxes. Now, in rural areas, we find that we find out that there is persistence on trust in local authorities, the need to obey authorities, and as well as persistence in social cohesion. So these findings are, pa are personally quite interesting. As we've recently completed a study on the Israeli National Revenue Authority's taxpayer education programs, we know substantial interregional variability uh, in the measures of tax morale and willingness to comply with tax obligations. Hi, Philip, can you hear we me? We also observe interregional differences along individual measures of our tax morale index as they relate to willingness to pay taxes. If they were confident, they would be spent to support the respondent's community or country. Willingness to cheat on taxes and trust that taxes will be spent wisely. So political affiliations, of course, play a large role in this. But it's interesting to think about the potential role that historical institutions also play. The findings that trust in the central government is not strongly associated with, uh, with uh, tax compliance, especially interest in the context of Sierra Leone and similar countries. We have some areas with weaker governance presence. Informal taxes are paid in amounts similar to formal taxes. Now, a recent study by, uh, by ICTD, International Center for Tax and Development, in 2019, found that uh, the perceptions of fairness of informal taxes are higher, despite informal taxes being more generally regressive. They suggest the mechanism may be that taxpayers trust informal institutions more than the states 
and believe that taxes will be put to good use. If the proportion of taxes paid to central government is lower, it makes sense that we see the role of trust in central government to be less important than interpersonal trust and norms to obey authorities. Pre-colonial and colonial institutions continue to shape how taxes are levied in Sierra Leone. Paramount chiefs, pay, Paramount chiefs play an important role in uh, collecting some form of taxation. And there's discussion about how NRA can partner in these structures, including even the MTRS, the Medium Term Revenue Strategy, to see how the National Revenue Authority can actually partner, not only with Paramount chiefs, but also with local government uh, in the collection of property taxes as well as other form of taxes. So in conclusion, the need to understand that besides the technocratic and administrative capacity of revenue administration, that politics, institutional determinants, and economic factors matter in the context of strengthening fiscal capacity for enhanced revenue and should be something for our African governments and development partners, of course, to consider in dealing with revenue mobilization in sub-Saharan Africa in particular. Therefore, I look forward to further research on this thematic area of fiscal states as I'm convinced of its relevance for changing the African story of revenue mobilization in addition to the technocratic fix widely suggested by our researchers as well as tax reformers. Some of the questions I've raised during the course of uh, this uh, uh, discussion, I believe could be areas of consideration for future research in this thematic area. I thank you. Thank you very much, Philip. Thank you. Uh, and I wanted to leave some time for questions, and I think Philip put some questions to the panelists. Is it okay if we go to the room first for any quick points, but more specifically questions? And we have about 10 minutes to, uh, to, to run through. So hands up from the floor. Let's assemble a few and then, then come back to the panel, if that's okay. Okay. Uh, I'm looking for any women with their hands up. Okay, so the, the, the flurry of gentlemen in the front. And if you can say uh, who you are, where you're from. Thank you. from you and Desa. There it goes. I hear it now. Um, so uh, uh, two quick questions. Um, one, I was very interested to, to to think even further back in history. I read a, a bunch of literature recently about the origin of the state in ancient times. Um, and it, you know, the point that a number of the authors were making is that key factor in the origin of the state itself was the ability to tax and that what kind of agricultural produce was being produced and whether that could be taxed. And I wondered how you think that might fit into the case of Uganda, the difference between why you have these two different regions, these, the, the non-state region and the state region, and how does that feed through to those pre-colonial institutions and then into present day. And then I, um, I wondered also for Marina, um, because if it's a very interesting, you know, it's a nice policy intervention, let's make your cadaster a better cadaster, we can improve, great. But, um, you know, it may also come with you know, uh, Antonio talked about other kinds of public goods and services that are being provided. And if a state has limited resources to invest, which one is going to give the biggest bang for the buck? And have you looked at some of that and whether investing in doing some of the property rights kind of intervention would be better or whether delivering better health care or better education? And because I, I also wonder about the, you know, kind of a cadaster is, is all or nothing, where you might be able to, if you can't manage all or nothing, maybe some of the other interventions might give you a little bit of boost. So uh, is there any evidence for any of that kind of thing? Did you look at any of those kind of cross interesting uh, comparisons? Okay, should we take one more before we go back, back to the panel? Um. Oliver Morrissey, University of Nottingham. Um, one for odd, and not in the context of your analysis, because I know it's not available, but more generally from your knowledge of the literature, um, you, know, you demonstrate an association with 
tax morale and how people answer a question of, you know, should you pay taxes type of question. But what is the evidence or is there evidence linking that to them actually paying taxes? Because it's one thing what people say, it's another thing what they do. And I'm just interested to know if there's any evidence on that. And a quick one from Marina. Is there anything about changes in property rights? Because that may be more important than the actual structure that's there. Okay. So... I don't know exactly what you mean by changing property rights. I mean, we observe changes in the extent of cadaster uh, uh, um, and the type of cadaster. Because uh, even like uh, in 1950s, there was a lot of narrative cadasters. Now it's almost gone. So this is the reason we observe a change and also the extent. I, this is when it comes to cadaster and formalizing property rights. In terms of like maybe the question is different, the changes in uh, property rights types. I don't know what what, what you mean exactly, Not but we are uh, from yeah, no, I mean, but um, we <laughs> we do. I hope uh, uh, capture this change, right? So the the, the vari at least the variation. At least uh, uh, there is no. There is not much change in terms of like you know we see a qualitative change from a s or in a situation from ne neo customary to more state. It's like more on the margin changes to be honest over the period. So there was we haven't observed the massive qualitative change. Maybe except for Rwanda actually, uh, uh, where they we, we which brings us to the question about the politics matter, right? I also come to this state state uh, kind of literature from the experience of studying the history of Swedish state. And you know, it was easy for Gustav Vasa, king, who introduced the, the, the taxation, because he decided that it's going to be the case. And the, there was no notions of democracy. <laughs> there was no notions of individual liberties, you know. It, th th there was no recourse to that, you know, for the for citizens, citizens resisted, but there was no. Now, yes, again, if you look at Rwanda, the, it's a success from the point of view of formalization of property rights, but we know that the story is normatively, right, a little bit um, tasty, because it's also accompanied with a lot of, uh, um, yeah, um, dictatorial type of politics, right? So. Uh, it's a difficult, right? So it's a difficult situation for 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 the. Again, in a, it's when we talk about how long it takes to, so it's like the steps. I agree with this, but uh, Sweden roll out mapped cadaster in 40 years with 30 surveyors in s from 1628 until 1960s, 70s. It's not a long story, right? But there was like there was no. The, the, the politics was conducive to this, you know, and the politics, I think, with the democracy uh, as a norm and individual rights, it's, it's the, the doing it the Gustav Vasa way becomes very, uh, unpalatable, right, this day. So the, we are we're facing this question as well. I think I will answer qu quickly both of these questions. I don't know other interventions. I mean, you know, you say policy, health policy. I, I mean, from I am state capacity scholar. This is not state capacity for me, right? It's like boosting the other side of the fiscal exchange, right? To provide something that people will pay. I don't know. Perhaps it is possible. We haven't ventured into this. Similarly, I really like this point about the uh, against Sierra Leone is uh, one of the success stories in the land and property tax uh, revenue. And cadaster is not enough. Cadaster is only about property rights. We need also a system of valuation. And the situation with this even worse around the world, and not only in developing countries, in developed countries as well, so than, than with cadaster. So we have two minutes left. So yeah, thank you so much. I, I think uh, your, your question or comment was about 
tracing the history of taxation further back than what we do here. This is also this is of course a question about what information data you have available. But uh, I think 20, 15 years ago we didn't believe it was possible to do this type of studies which uh, Michelopoulos and uh, Nunn and other were doing. And uh, there are a number of econo economic historians working on this now. And, in, uh, and uh, you have also now established the African Economic History Network, which are really digging into things, not related necessarily to taxation, but the evolution of state and, and, and uh, societies. Um, so uh, I was just thinking about, well, you have the Weber and Wildowski book from 1986, the history of taxation and expenditure in the Western world, which goes back to Babylon or earlier and traces the whole. That could be an interesting long-term research project, the history of taxation and expenditure in Sub-Saharan Africa. But it will be a long-term project. You have to, because data information is challenging, but it's very interesting. When Oliver, yes, I completely agree with you that uh, the Afrobarometer is perception-based. And, uh, and then it's easy to say, yes, I'm willing to pay tax, blah, 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 given, often given that the services are, are uh, provided. Um, we don't know here whether actually people actually pay taxes. Uh, that is now the next step. And I, be, I have a big faith here that with, uh, by, by, using, by getting access to administrative data, you can do that more. And that is something we also try now in, in Tanzania, to link up administrative data with survey data. Uh, of course, as we discussed yesterday, there are challenges here with the administrative data. But I think that is a way to move forward, to get more credible results here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Antonio, will you address uh, Philip's question about when will countries like Sierra Leone become full state? Uh, sure. No, that's um, actually I was thinking the same. Thank you, Philip. That was uh, probably the point that uh, you know is, uh, really resonates with uh, my own thinking. Uh, we've been arguing that uh, Rome wasn't built in a day. But then uh, how long does it take to become a, a fiscal state? A legitimate question. Let me be brief and at the same time uh, humble. One way to go about this is to do further research. Kunal and I were already thinking about this. Do we see any episodes of uh, change in taxation that are significant, especially in sub-Saharan Africa? And what explains that? So that's for us. Uh, we agree with you, Philip. This is definitely, uh, you know, uh, uh, th there is room for further research. Is a very good point. If I had to provide, uh, you know, really be bold, almost to the point of being careless and provide an estimate, I could say, let's look at the fiscal history of uh, advanced economies. It took probably at least the whole of last century to develop fiscal states, because. Uh, Pre-World War I data show that states were very small in terms of taxation be around that time. But I wouldn't be doing a, a good job if I tell you that. Because uh, we know that uh, how history unfolded in advanced economies, for example, look at the role of uh, external conflict. This is not necessarily the case. It doesn't mean that uh, this will explain how long it takes in a less developed economy context. Uh, and finally on this point, we did try some rough econometric estimates in our own paper with uh, Abrams and Kunal. Uh, we did some uh, so-called causality tests to see uh, roughly is it political institutions that uh, feedback cause taxation or is it also the other way around? And we had the uh, data of about uh, 200 years for uh, a sample of uh, uh, developed uh, and uh, emerging economies. And what we found was not particularly interesting in the sense that we found that the heterogeneity in our estimates was pervasive. We used, uh, Abrams did some great work with panel time series so on that. So we thought, we concluded that uh, we couldn't really say too much about the dynamics. So a bit disappointing at this stage, uh, Philip, but uh, you know, that, that's, uh, that's what I can share on this, and I'll, I'll stop uh, here. 
Thank you. That's great. Um, so I think it's been a great session. So thank you very much to Antonio, Marina, Odhelga, and Philip. Uh, I guess I have to say more questions in, in the lunch queue, please. Um, and to finish with a round of applause, I think our panelists have deserved it. So thank you.